Hi, good morning. Thanks everybody for joining us for our weekly morning webinar. For today's topics, we'll be covering Capital Corp Initiation, Yuma Strategic Holdings, Dustin Retail Trust, Airbnb IPO, followed by Flip on the Ground, Far East Orchard, BRC Asia, and First Read. And we'll, we'll be covering some macro outlook with regards to SG Banking Monthly and Singapore Weekly. Uh, so without further ado, I'll pass on to Terence to start off with the Capital Corp initiation. Yep, thanks Timothy. So we initiated on Capital Corporation uh, last week uh, with a target price of uh, $6.12. And I think Capital Corp, uh, we don't need, uh, don't need much introduction, but we provided some uh, background on, on the, the main uh, four main operations that they operate in. Uh, you can see the, the quick summary on, on your left-hand side. Uh, offshore and marine is obviously a, a very core business for them. And in, in this business, they, they, do, uh, they do offshore rig design, they build rigs, uh, and also some uh, repair and specialized shipbuilding. Uh, in a property segment, which is, is, is a key uh, business segment for them, especially in the last few years, uh, the, 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 in terms of profit contribution, uh, Keppoland has a pipeline of about 45,000 homes in Singapore, but obviously their, their core markets are in China and Vietnam as well. Uh, infrastructure is another core segment for them. And uh, in this segment, you can see they do power generation, uh, logistics and data center, a very, very stable segment for them. Investments, the last uh, but not least, uh, is, is actually their interest in capital. capital. It's actually a very, very small uh, revenue contribution for them in the last few years. But it has, uh, in, in financial year 19, when they acquired M1, then the contribution actually shot up. So you can see in, in the, on, on the, on the, this, this uh, chart here on your, your, your right, figure one, you can see uh, it's almost uh, equal contribution from all. Uh, uh, the, the investment segment is, is 14%, uh, but this is 14% because in financial year 19, they, they actually uh, uh, acquired M1 and the consolidation was only done uh, in the second half. So about uh, if we if we factor in the full year contribution, each, the the weightage should be equal like, between all the the, the different different uh, operating segments. But when we look at Figure Two, you can see the EBITDA uh, breakdown is actually higher highest for for the property segment. It's, it's actually uh, the the takes the lion's share of EBITDA. I think forty four percent of 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 uh, contribution in the EBITDA segment, especially for the property segment. So what this, this tells you is that the property segment is really contributing the bulk of their, their profits. But why are we initiating now? The, one of the reasons is because you, if you look at the, the, the ROE, and this is in figure three, you can see the, the ROE in the last five to six years is actually very lackluster. It used to be around mid-teens. Uh. Now it's uh, actually less than, than uh, uh, 10%. So what uh, in our three investment thesis uh, in the next slide, we cover the reasons why we cover uh, initiate on capital now. Uh, firstly, they have affirmed that they would uh, commit to, to recycle capital of up to $17.5 billion. And we think that this is a potential rebating catalyst. $17.5 billion, just to put it in context, is about two times their, their, their current market cap. So that's, that's actually very huge. Uh, of course, they, they didn't provide a timeline, but and 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 capital recycling is 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 a part and parcel of their business. You can see it, we provided this uh, uh, chart in Figure Four. Uh, capital recycling is just part and parcel of their business, but while the, the the key difference this time is they actually unveil a number and they identify some of these assets. We'll, we'll talk about this slightly later, but in the past they didn't use to provide all these assets. So the fact that they actually provide more of these assets now, we think is 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 a positive. The second uh, investment thesis is the 100-day program uh, that they, they just launched. They launched this 100-day program uh, in the, actually in the, 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 the uh, end of September, beginning of October. And this 100-day uh, program will actually do a, perform a strategic review on Keppel O&M and, and uh, Keppel Logistics. And for some of you who remember, you can remember that in August this year, what happened was uh, Kainai actually, uh, Kainai, the wholly owned subsidiary of Tomastic, actually uh, we drew their partial takeover offer of Keppel and that caused the whole Keppel group to actually uh, sink. Uh, so a major derating of the shares. But now with this uh, strategic review ongoing for Keppel o &M, uh, we think that the outcome will be likely and then we move a key overhang and we could see a potential re-rating of the shares later. And the group also reaffirmed their longer term ROE target of 15%. We'll come to this slightly later. So we elaborate more on our first investment thesis in our next slide. 
And you can see in our next slide, the the they actually divesting 17.5 billion. We actually provided a breakdown here in the table uh, below. You can see the 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 land bank and projects under development seven seven billion. This is a, a, the, the the almost half of their total amount that they are divesting, and this seven billion that they are divesting is actually held at book value. So we know capital actually holds. Uh, a lot of assets and they've held these assets over time a, 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 for a very long time. They're Keppel, Harbour Bay and you know, the Tianjin Eco City. They've been holding this since 2000 and 2010. So right now, if we compare the carrying carrying value and the, the, the book value rather with the, the market value, we, we see about 40 to 50% appreciation on average. So if they're able to divest these assets at market value, the, the, the gains will be huge for them. Uh, even though they also, even though they didn't, didn't, didn't talk about how, how when they're going to realize this 17.5 billion, we think it's 30 years, uh, sorry, uh, 10 years because three, the, it's a vision 2030 plan. But at least we know they've committed three to five billion for divestments in the next three years. And this, this, is, this is going to be very good. Uh, and, and we've provided also uh, this table here. It's a little bit small on, the, on this, 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 this chart here. Uh, but you know, in, if you go to our initiation report, it, it, it should be bigger. But you can see the, from the Singapore segment, you can see the Keppel Bay Tower and Keppel Towers that they can potentially divest into some of the REITs that they, they currently hold. So in, in, to, in total, all these $17.5 billion, once, once divested, they can actually reinvest into new growth areas like data center and lo logistics and renewable energy, which is actually their intention. Sec our second investment thesis uh, in our next slide, we'll talk about the the hundred day program which will provide greater clarity on capital O and M. So for those of y'all who been following capital group, y'all will know the the O and M business is actually their biggest problem child right now So the the current strategic review of the O and M and the logistics unit will provide greater clarity and and we think. I think the, the, the market's talking about different outcomes, but we, we see three reasons why the, 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 something is likely to happen. Something is going to happen. Uh, the, we, we think the strategic review will throw up something. And here, is, here are three reasons. The, you, you see, for figure seven here, you can see the, the CSSC and CISC actually merged in December 2019. And you can see that, that we provided the total assets value here uh, for, for this table, uh, at the, this chart here at the bottom left hand corner. And you can see the Chinese players and the, the, the Korean players are, are really much bigger than Keppel o and and Samcom Marine. So we, we think, we think a, a, a merger will not only bring about cost synergies, but more importantly, revenue synergies as well, because you, 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 there'll be a better position to compete with these, 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 these guys there. Now, and also at the beginning of the year, the second reason is because at the beginning of the year, you can remember because of COVID, actually oil prices actually plummeted, nearly went, nearly went to zero, actually under zero like for a short while. So the, the, the oil prices actually resulted, low oil prices now, actually even after the, 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 the recovery is still below pre-COVID levels. And you can see the, the, the last chart here, the, 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 in terms of oil majors, capex, capital expenditure actually really just keep coming down and their order books actually really at almost all time low. So we think uh, 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 the strategic review uh, could see a possible merger between Keppel O&M and, and, and Sam Marine. And this will then move Keppel to an asset-like model and also uh, provide re-rating to capital going forward. Uh, our, in our last slide, the strategic review will also uh, likely reaffirm and uh, capital's long-term target to 15%. Capital's uh, shipyards was, amongst their businesses, the shipyard was the most worst affected uh, in, 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 at the beginning of the year. Uh, so what we understand now is the, the shipyards have resumed operations. Uh, 15 thousand workers are already back at their work sites as at the end of the third quarter. So they, they, you, you can see uh, in this table here at the, at the, the bottom left hand corner, you can see the, the target ROE and the 2019 ROE. You can see the Keppel Offshore and Marine and Keppel Logistics is really very, very far off uh, compared to the rest of the units. The rest of the units uh, are very, very close to the, the target ROE, but the o and and the logistics segment is obviously very far away. So we, we think the the uh, move 
to do a strategic review of these businesses, we'll, we'll actually move them closer to the 15% ROE target. You've seen, you can see here, they provide very detailed breakdown of where the ROE segments will come from. Uh, and if they can go inch closer, inch closer towards the 15% ROE target, then we think the, 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 the business will, will, it will lead to a further re-rating of the business. In our last slide, we cover the, the, our valuation of the capital group. And because the, the capital group is, is, is such a, a big business, there are different parts uh, inside the, the business. So we value them based on the sum of the parts valuation, uh, of course, with a 10% holding company discount. So you can see we value uh, the O&M segment at 0 0.6 times book value in the comparable stable at the bottom. You can see uh, Samcorp Marine, uh, we, we put out the, some of the comparables, like Samcorp Marine, Yang Zijiang, and the Costco uh, group there. And, but the, the most important column here, actually the price to book value year zero, it's a bit small again, uh, but if, if you go to the initiation report, it may be clearer. But you can see here, we, it's 0 0.7 times the average book value. But given the current strategic review ongoing for the o and business, and because of the current uh, low price overhang, we actually price it a slight discount, uh, to, to peers, so 0 0.6 times. And for the property segment, we, we put it at 40% discount to RNAV in line with, with, with how the market's pricing it, also the property segment. The infrastructure business at 12 times, very, very stable business, be considered essential business. Uh, so the, 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 the business do, did very well. Uh, and M1 at 12 times uh, FY21 earnings. Uh, their, their peers, Singtel and, and uh, Starhub, they're currently trading about 13 times, but because M1 is a, uh, a private company now. Lah. So we, we, we price it at a slight discount given the, the lack of financial details also that they were released. And of course, their, their Sino Singapore Tianjin Eco City project at one and a half times book value. So the Sino Singapore Tianjin Eco City project is already, they've already broken even already. Whatever land parcels that they sell now, it's all profit. Lah. So now, now we, we priced it at 1.5 times book value because this was acquired uh, long ago for this, this project. So most of the land parcels that they sell now, they should realize again, we estimate plus minus, lah, uh, they should realize again of about 50% on their, their land cost. That's, that's how, how strong uh, this project is. So our target price of $6.12 is actually uh, a, a slight discount but it's just about one times FY21 book value. You can see FY21 book value is about $6.14. So our 6 12 is just about there. So we so we we, we think the 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 current strategic review ongoing for the capital O and M group will will remove the overhang and then we'll see a re-rating. But that's it. The the even at the current levels capital O and uh, capital is considered cheap like, versus their, their historical uh, book value. Historically, the last five years, they trade about one times uh, book value. Now they are, they are trading at a, a discount. So if they re-rate back to one times book value, then, then uh, that, that'd be, that'd be uh, uh, $6.12, like, our, our target price. So that's all from me. Um, I'll now pass on to Jie Kui, who will cover Yoma. Jie Kui, over to you. Okay, um, thanks, Terence. So now I'll move on to Yoma's full year results. Okay, so for the positives, um, the top line actually performed within expectations, like for both six months and on a full year basis. In terms of six months results, uh, their revenue actually increased by 25%, year on year, boosted by um, strong growth from the real estate development segment, as well as the automotive and heavy equipment segment. This is then partially offset um, by the weakness in real estate services due to competitive leasing as well as um, cons the consumer segment which um, is attributable to the lockdowns in April, May and September. Nevertheless, um, their, core, their core operating EBITDA for both periods um, are still uh, positive. And then um, negatives wise, um, the, bottom line, the bottom line for both um, six months and um, full year was actually hit. For six months, it's mainly due to um, Forex impairments as well as associate losses. The bulk of the six months um, September 20 losses came from Forex losses due to the conversion of US dollar um, valuation into, into Myanmar currency at the subsidiary level. And then um, Yoma also booked its uh, fair share of losses from the Memories Group whose um, tourism operations were actually impacted by COVID-19 and as well as um, the translation losses and borrowings. Yeah, on borrowing, sorry. Yeah, therefore, um, all in all for six months, 20, their net loss was um, 48 million, yeah, for the half year. And then uh, for the full year, 
um, FY20 bottom line was mainly impacted due to lower margins as well as um, net fair value losses. So um, the FY20 gross profit margins are keep plunged from 50% to um, 32%. This is due to lower real estate revenue, which a key is the is one of the main generators of high gross of higher gross profit margins. And then the other factors included um, lower margin products, so um, such as um, the products in Star City, as well as um, lower consumer margins due to higher packaging and delivery costs. And coupled with um, net fair value losses of 12 million. Um, as compared to the 9 million other gains recorded last year, this actually resulted in a net loss increase of 77% year on year. So in terms of outlook, um, Myanmar actually saw a resurgence of cases back then in September, but with the recent lockdown, um, the situation is more controlled. Performance for, F for Yoma FMB and Yoma Motors is likely to be weak in the near term. However, for the top line uh, for, for FY21, we think that it should still be supported by significant um, unrecognized revenue at Yoma Land and Yoma, Yoma Motors. As of um, the nine month, as of um, date, um, Yoma actually uh, sold an estimated 200 plus units of Mitsubishi um, car units. They are pending recognition, which means, um, as in which estimated um, about 10 million of um, unrecognized revenue that hasn't been recognized. Yeah, and then um, over at Yoma Land, unrecognized revenue for City Loft amounts to $12 million. And following the recent launch, Star, um, Star Villas uh, Phase 1, which is Yoma's first landed development in Star City, actually accumulated um, 15 million US dollars for recognition as well. Yeah, Star, Star Villas is expected to be completed in the next 12 to 15 months, which means that um, over the next 12 to 15 months, uh, we will be expecting like um, revenue to be recorded because um, this project is actually recorded on a uh, percentage to completion basis. And um, phase two, following the success, success of, phase, of phase one, um, it will actually be launched in the coming months. And these projects will be expected to support FY21 stop line. Additionally, we are looking at a turnaround in FY22, underpinned by projects such as um, Yoma Central and Star Hub due, um, yeah, that is due for completion. So um, upon completion of Yoma Central in mid um, FY22, we are expecting about 100 million worth of recurring revenue, which is equivalent to FY20's whole year revenue um, to be generated as recurring income for the group. And additionally, um, Yoma actually launched um, Star Hub, which is the first suburban um, commercial property at Star City. Um, for this project, uh, actually more than 50% of the office space has been committed by um, prominent technology and financial services company. So um, yeah, and then um, the rental use here are estimated to be at the mid-teens and um, is likely to be reflected in FY22. So lastly, in terms of our valuation, um, our segmental assumptions, um, has been updated according to what Yoma has guided for um, the recent um, results that they have uh, provided. Yeah, our metrics has have largely uh, remained unchanged and there hasn't been any meaningful change to our target price. Therefore, um, we still maintain a buy at a target price, a SOTP ta target price of 46 cents. Now, this is all from me. I'll pass on my time to Ned for Dustin. Uh, good morning, everyone. So this is Dustin's uh, third quarter update. So jumping right in, if you look at the graph on the left, um, this is actually uh, Dustin's revenue on a, more, on a more basis for the nine months um, ended uh, 2020. For On the same store basis, uh, means for the malls for Xiaolan, um, Ocean E-Color as well as Shizhi, the first four malls. Um, these are the four malls that existed for, for, for the entire 12 months. So on the same store basis, uh, revenue was down by about 18%. However, if you include um, the acquisition of Tomen, Toman that was uh, acquired on September 2019, as well as Shunta and Tanpei, they were acquired this year in July 2020. Then uh, revenue were risen by about 13%. Uh, so on a positive note, uh, cash revenue uh, recovered to ne negative 7.5% of uh, 3Q19 levels. Uh, this is an improvement compared to the turnover rent um, that was shared with us in June, which was down by about 9.6%. Um, if you look in the graph on the right, so the graph on the right actually shows a steadily increasing um, turnover rent that has occurred um, in the months from February to June. So uh, the second positive is the lease renewals. So lease renewals have 
reduced the FY20 ex lease expiries from 13.8% to 8.1%. Uh, the majority of the leases that are expiring in FY20 will come from Xiaolan, um, Ocean, as well as Shizhi Metro Malls. And these assets have maintained high occupancies of 89, 98 to 99%. Uh, and the steadily recovery in um, tenant sales is encouraging and may return confidence to tenants who have been delaying their renewal decisions. On the negative side, um, we note that portfolio occupancy has dipped quarter on quarter from 97 to 96.1%. Um, and this compares to three quarter um, 2019, where occupancy was 98.6%. So this is a whole 2.5% lower uh, year on year. So the most notable decline was at Tassim e color, uh, which fell, where occupancy fell from 90.7% 90, 90 to 85.1%. Um, However, Ikala was is is the smallest mall in the portfolio and only accounts for 4.1% .1 of um, nine months 20 revenue revenue. So apart from that, um, the rest of the malls uh, sustained the high occupancy above 95%. Um, the second negative is the termination of the remaining nine-year lease with Superior City Departmental Store. So the initial lease term was for 15 a uh, year for a 15 year period, which was supposed to end in uh, 2029. And this was for a substantial amount of space, um, 12,000 square feet, which, which, which is approximately 18% uh, of um, mall space at Ocean Metro Mall. So the reason for termination was the struggling um, departmental store business. And the space will be leased out to a, to a related party, um, Zhongshan, Metro, Zhongshan Tassin Metro Mall, for a one-year period on the same rental terms. So that means that there will not be any uh, rental disruption for the next one year. Uh, and during this one year lease, um, there will, the space, the 12,000 square foot space will progressively undergo um, asset enhancement initiatives and it will be carved up and changed, uh, converted to a multi-tenant lease. So this will actually allow um, the, I mean, allow Tassin to um, increase rentals because Typically, there are discounts that are offered on a larger on a larger space, yeah. and just for just for reference, um, just last year, uh, the the mall manager actually um, undertook a uh, AEI, and they were able to uh, this AEI was for a uh, nine thousand square feet space, and they were able to increase rentals by about 40, 43 percent on this space. So in terms of outlook, apart from the opportunity for rental reversions through AEI. Um, Tassin is also positioned to benefit from the transformation of the Greater Bay Area. Um, just, just as a recap, um, there are two financial exchanges that will be um, that will that will be opened within the Greater Bay Area. So one of them is in Guangzhou, which is for a carbon emissions future trading kind of exchange, and another one will be in Macau, uh, and that will be a Nasdaq-like market for startups. So the the more population, I mean the population in the Greater Bay Area. Uh, is expected to increase by about 43% over the next uh, few years. And Tassin malls will benefit because as you can see in the graph on the right, um, these are all the malls that are in the Tassin portfolio, which are, and they are all within the Greater Bay Area. And this, the malls are within a one hour traffic radius uh, from the Greater Bay Area cities. And they also, because they're tier two cities, they provide affordable housing um, for the surrounding Oh, sorry, affordable housing alternatives um, for the surrounding um, tier one cities like Guangzhou and Shenzhen. Um, the, last, the last point would be um, you know, the rofo pipeline of 18 assets that exist for Tassin. So this will form a pipeline of um, inorganic growth for Tassin um, over, to, to, to tap on over the next few years. So overall, we upgrade to buy. Um, and with a lower target price of 90, 90 cents. So target price was lowered from 91 cents to 90, 90 cents um, due to the, due, after factoring in an enlarged share base from the recent share offering. So stock catalyst, uh, as mentioned, is the growth in population in, in the Greater Bay Area, potential acquisitions and rental uplift from post AEIs. So that's all for me. Um, I'll pass the time on to Jun Rong, oh, sorry, to Wee Kwang. Thank you, Natalie. Okay, so I'll be talking about uh, banking monthly for December. Uh, if we look at the interest rates for November itself, um, we see that actually it has remained roughly the same compared to the third quarter. And for the third quarter results, we saw that the banks uh, actually reported uh, net interest margins of about 1.53% on average, uh, which was uh, 
also due to the low interest rate in the quarter. So in the fourth quarter, where, where we see that the interest rates are kind of stabilized um, in October and November itself, we think that um, the entire, uh, that the interest rates will be remain at similar levels over the fourth quarter as well as uh, 2021. So this will see, uh, this will see um, net interest margins drop to 1.6% um, from the year to date about 1.63%. Uh, yeah, 1.63% drop to 1.6% for the entire uh, 2020. And then it'll be about 1.55% in uh, year 2021. Yeah. Uh, okay, next. Okay, so for the loans growth itself, we saw that um, loans uh, weakened in October. Um, the local loans actually fell 2% year on year, which was the sharpest decline reported since August 2016 of which uh, business loans actually fell by almost 2%, which is the worst also since um, October 2016. Um, consumer loans fell 2.06% year on year, but um, this is a, this just to note that uh, this is a recovery for the fourth consecutive months. Uh, yeah, because uh, in, I think for, since four months, uh, since before that, uh, consumer loans was already uh, falling at a much higher rate before COVID-19. Uh, before COVID yeah. Um, for the when we look at the capital market performance in November, we saw that uh, securities turnover uh, SDAV actually grew thirty five percent year on year in November itself. Um, so this was a very high improvement compared to October. Sorry, October is not. Uh, oh, the table on the left sorry is not thirty five percent. I think uh, for October itself it was plus eight percent. But then November itself is actually uh, SDAV was up thirty five percent. Yeah. So this was the fastest pace since uh, since the since June. And the top five equity index futures actually grew 11.6% year on year. Um, and this, if you can see the table on the bottom left, you can see that actually the FTSE Taiwan index turnover reached a level similar to what was uh, achieved by the MSCI counterpart from a year ago. As such, we see that actually this is still early on uh, before the expiry of the MSCI contracts. And with this uh, kind of like full replacement of the FTSE Taiwan index futures, we think that um, SGX will not see any impact on the earnings for financial year 2021. And yeah, uh, as compared to what they initially guided, which was about 10 to 15% uh, impact on their earnings. Um, then, uh, so overall, the market activity was, uh, was probably higher due to the better market sentiments on the conclusion of the US uh, elections, as well as the positive COVID-19 vaccine news during the month itself. And okay, so just a brief overview of what, uh, what was the results for the Singapore banks in the third quarter. Uh, first of all, we take a look at net interest income. Across the board, uh, it fell by about 13 to, uh, sorry, 11 to 13% uh, for net interest income. This was on the back of what we saw a new compression roughly uh, to about 1.5 to 1.53%, around 1.53% on average, and also uh, poor loans growth. And moving forward, we know that loans growth will likely remain subdued. Uh, and interest will also remain low. As such, the run rate for net interest income should be at a similar to the current levels, unless uh, unless something unless the interest rate kind of uh, start, start going up again, which is unlikely. Uh, for non in, non interest income, we see that uh, for fees and commission, it, it fell by two percent to nine percent across the board. Um, but uh, something to take note of is that all three banks actually recovered by about fifteen percent from the second quarter which was during the circuit breaker period. So uh, this, is, uh, this is in line with our expectations when, when that uh, this fee and commission income will recover when we exit the circuit breaker period, yeah, where, where we saw uh, the branches, uh, close, the closing of the certain, certain branches during the, during the period. And for other non-interest income, we see that it's uneven across the board. We saw that UOB actually fell by 27%, uh, and whereas, DBS grew by 11% and OCBC grew by 22%. The large portion of these differences is come from uh, trading income, of which I think uh, UOB just didn't do very well in terms of trading income. Uh, total, and then the next uh, important thing that we want to take a look at is the allowance level of allowances. So year on year, of course, uh, we know that during this period, uh, the banks are all increasing their allowances uh, just to cope, just to build up their reserves uh, for, for the loans itself in the case of that turning back over the next uh, one year. And what we saw was that for DBS and OCBC, they are already starting to taper off. So quarter on quarter, their allowances have come off a bit. And for UOB, um, although their quarter on quarter is a bit higher, but for them, uh, 
um, the specific provisions on impaired loans itself is actually um, lower, lower on the lower end compared to the other two banks. So this is a good thing for UOB. And as a result, we see that uh, for the net, uh, net income across the three banks, uh, it is down by between 10 to 40% for various reasons. Okay, so just some uh, news that came up across the past month as well. Uh, so we know just last week, uh, RBI actually approved of the merger of DBS and uh, Lakshmi Vilas Bank. So the merger, uh, it was announced in 25th of November and the merger was enforced with effect from 27th of November. So we know that this merger will see LVB actually, uh, sorry, DBS actually inject about 470 million uh, Sing dollars in, into the, to the merge entity. So this will provide some short-term cost headwinds, especially with uh, LVB still running an operating loss in the meantime. And then uh, also last Friday evening, we saw that uh, MES actually announced the four digital banking licenses uh, that were awarded, of which two of them were digital full banks and two of them are digital wholesale banks. For the digital full bank, we saw the Grab Singtel Consortium actually uh, winning one of the licenses and C Limited, which is the parent company of Garina, uh, winning the other. For the wholesale bank side, uh, N, N, Finan N Group, which is N Financial, they won one of the, one of the uh, licenses and the other consortium uh, comprising of Greenland Financial Holdings, Link Logis, Hong Kong and Beijing Cooperative Equity Investment uh, won the other license. So the digital wholesale bank side, uh, MES was willing to give up to three licenses, but then they only awarded two. And it was kind of noted that uh, basically for these two, they are more uh, just ahead of the game compared to others when uh, choosing the criteria. But uh, MES did note that they might be willing to review this and issue more uh, digital wholesale bank licenses in the future. All, all the four banks are, oh, okay, all these, um, new digital entrants will are likely to begin their operations in 2022. So in the meantime, um, if you take a look at what, uh, how they are trying to prepare for entering the market, uh, we do not think that they will cause any disruption uh, or for the local banks itself. Instead, um, we know that Singapore being a well bank society, as well as uh, how, how, the, how the COVID-19 has accelerated the digitization of the three local banks itself, we think that um, actually the local banks actually have a head start to this uh, to the to the race to the digitalization race in Singapore. As such, it is more of the of the how the new entrants are more of the challenges that the new entrants will be facing when they come into the when come into the scene. And so, if we take a look at uh, digital banks across the world, we know that only a few out of the hundreds that are, are operating are actually profitable. So most of them, I, I believe that the digital banking licenses will only help all these new entrants to strengthen their core business. And you use this digital banking license as a way to strengthen their core, uh, their core business rather than uh, trying to disrupt the entire financial system in Singapore. So we maintain uh, our Singapore banking sector at neutral. Um, although we know that uh, coming off third quarter, we, we think that the credit outlook has been brightened with more clarity on asset quality. Uh, we see that uh, for OCBC and DBS, they have already started to lower their credit, as in they have already provided less allowances quarter on quarter. And for UOB, um, because of the loan moratorium ending in uh, October for the Malaysian side, they have also guided for lower credit costs going into uh, 2021. And so earnings recovery to pre-COVID-19 levels, although yeah, we see that uh, will be boosted by um, these lower allowances in 2021, but the full level back to pre-COVID-19 levels is expected to be only in 2022. Uh, as a result, we downgrade our OCBC and UOB to neutral or maintaining DBS as neutral as well uh, on the recent share price rally, despite an upward revision in our target prices. So our target prices revision can be seen at a table on the bottom right hand corner. Uh, and within the sector itself, we actually prefer UOB uh, due to the past two quarters, we saw that um, during the, this whole COVID-19 pandemic, uh, UOB actually maintained the lowest level in terms of specific provisions. And uh, they are moving forward, they are also having a lower credit cost guidance. So we think that for them, compared to their peers, they will have a faster earnings recovery in 2021 and moving into 2022. And that's it from me. I'll now hand the time over to Jin Rong for the Airbnb IPO. Okay, uh, thank you, Wee Kwang.
So now we'll be touching on the upcoming uh, IPO for Airbnb. So this is the, some of the key, uh, this is a key summary of the IPO details. So uh, they are mainly uh, selling around 52 million shares. Offer price is between uh, $44 to $50. Uh, this is expected. The final IPO price will be set on the 9th of December, which is uh, this Wednesday. And then the shares will uh, start trading uh, on 10th December, uh, which is this Thursday. So at the high end of the range, uh, the valuation of Airbnb is around $35 billion. So to, to put it into context, this is uh, equivalent to uh, Hilton uh, global hotel chain for the market value. And compared with its uh, full year 2019 uh, revenue, its price to sales is around uh, 7.3 times. So this is a uh, kind of on the pricier uh, end of the end of the spectrum. In terms of dividend wise, if you are looking for dividends, uh, Airbnb do not anticipate uh, themselves paying any uh, cash dividends in the foreseeable future. Uh, important things to take note is that the offering of this uh, 52 million shares is only around 8.6% uh, of its uh, total share outstanding. So a company with its uh, strong demand, uh, we may expect uh, quite a huge jump uh, in the near term when, when it uh, began trading. Uh, just some brief introduction on uh, Airbnb. Uh, we all know that their primary source of uh, revenue comes from a booking service fee. But how they generate these fees is that uh, it's mainly split into two uh, avenues. One is in terms of accommodation. So they actually have a split fee whereby the host and the guest will each pay a service fee to Airbnb. So under this uh, system, hosts usually pay uh, 3%. Whereas the guests will pay uh, up to 14.2% depending on the booking uh, subtotal. So if you were to use Airbnb platform before, when you check out, they will have the added fee, which you know they will denote as a cleanup fee or nightly fee. All these are actually paid to uh, Airbnb. And there's another system whereby they, they have this host only fee, whereby the host will, will uh, cover all the expenses and then they will typically pay between 14 to 16% to uh, Airbnb. The other avenue is a, is a Airbnb experience. So this is whereby they provide all those you know, uh, traditional uh, uh, tour, uh, whereby the host will, will bring the guests uh, around. And then uh, for this system, uh, the host usually pay a 20% uh, service fee to Airbnb. So in a way you can think of it for Airbnb, it's quite a, uh, you can think of it as quite easy money because you know they provide a platform and then uh, they just take a cut of uh, whatever bookings that go through their platform. In terms of revenue breakdown, uh, pre-COVID, 37% uh, is from US, 63% is from uh, other region. And as of uh, 30th September this year, its uh, listing has an active rate of around 75%. Uh, active rate means that you know for the past one year, they actually have at least one uh, booking. Uh, we believe this IPO actually unlocked a lot of uh, value proposition for Airbnb. Uh, one is that we know that Airbnb has been hit by this uh, COVID situation, whereby interna international travel has been uh, quite bad. So they actually burned through 1.2 billion of cash uh, between mid-2019 and mid-2020. So with this uh, IPO net proceed, accompanied with some of the debt holdings that they, that they undertook earlier this year, they actually have a sufficient liquidity to last uh, at least for the next five years under this uh, worst scenario. So in a way, uh, its capital is quite strong. There is a little cause of a worry. And of course, with this IPO, when they undertook uh, 1.9 billion of debt uh, at the start of the year, they are actually paying very, very high uh, interest rate between 9% to 11.5%. So with this IPO, um, what it can do is to pay down the debt and then to uh, potentially uh, reduce uh, rollover and reduce the cost of debt. And uh, another proposition is that employees can cash in on the company stocks. Uh, there was quite a, a bit of a issue over this uh, for the past uh, few years. And that is why uh, this is one of the reasons uh, why they want to come out with this uh, IPO. And lastly is that um, Airbnb, they are also turning to uh, inorganic uh, growth. So we can see pre-COVID, they actually acquire uh, two platforms. Uh, one is uh, a last minute uh, hotel booking site. The other is a booking site for like a uh, longer term uh, corporate business stay. So in a way they are trying to evolve to not just uh, being just a home sharing service. 
Uh, some positive uh, rely about Airbnb. Uh, one is that it's an asset-like uh, platform business uh, model. It does not own uh, any of the rental uh, uh, properties. And uh, having an asset-like business model actually allow it to manage uh, its costs better. It, uh, it gives them a greater flexibility to manage costs to adapt to a challenging environment. So we actually witnessed this in uh, third Q 2020. Um, with them being hit by the COVID, they are actually able to reduce their cost by a massive uh, 35% and uh, allowing them to actually return to uh, profitability. So this is a vast uh, difference as compared to the hotel industry where you know uh, they still have to fork out costs to maintain all the hotel uh, properties. And another positive is that uh, Airbnb does have a competitive advantage. So um, in a way, its listing price is more competitive. It caters. Um, it can cater more to the lower end of the. Uh, it can cater more for for the lower end of the income stream, and of course, it has a strong uh, global presence, and there's a wide variety of options uh, for you to choose from. And the uh, last thing is that um, due to this COVID situation, there's actually a shift in vacation to a less densely uh, populated uh, neighboring communities, and all these uh, more rural areas may not actually have uh, hotels. So Airbnb may may stood up as a safer alternative in this way. Uh, the last positive is that uh, they are hit by the international the curb in the international travel, but they're actually seeing a shift uh, towards a stronger domestic travel. So domestic travel around the world has actually remained uh, quite resilient and it actually saw a monthly growth of a 17% uh, percent year on year. And if you look at the gross daily rate, so gross daily rate is like, uh, you can think of it as a hotel room rate. They actually have exceeded a pre-COVID level uh, due to faster recovery in uh, some uh, region which has recovered from the COVID uh, situation. And also there, there has also been a trend towards uh, booking of entire homes. So due to this COVID situation, you know, people may be wary to, to share the home with uh, other people. So if they were to travel, they will just you know, uh, book the entire home. Uh, this will be a policy for Airbnb because I mean with, uh, with uh, by booking the entire home, they actually take more cut uh, from the from the higher amount itself. Uh, some of the risks that we need to take note of, uh, of course, near term uh, COVID nineteen pandemic are still raging on in the US, and as I mentioned, you know, uh, US actually account for for around a third of its uh, revenue. So uh, for Q twenty twenty, we may see a decrease in the bookings in the affected region. And of course, uh, seasonally June to September uh, quarter is typically the stronger. Uh, period for Airbnb due to summer vacation. So moving into the, the end of the year, uh, there's a tendency to see a decline in uh, booking uh, before it starts to pick up again in uh, next year, first quarter. And they are also facing a uh, competition uh, by Booking.com and Expedia, which are quite a, a giant in the online travel market. So overall conclusion, uh, first is that they have, they have a strong capital position. They can weather this uh, COVID-19 uh, crisis. And with this uh, optimism around uh, vaccine, it, will, it boosts uh, sentiments around travel stock. So Airbnb will be able to gain uh, as a recovery play. And Airbnb has a track record of uh, turning in uh, positive profits. So, um, but you know, with all the profits, they, they tend to splurge a lot on uh, marketing expenses. So during this COVID, they actually cut back on a lot of their marketing expenses. And then they are actually able to you know, deliver a positive uh, profit. And for the past three years, their business has been generating a uh, positive uh, operating cash flow. So this, uh, I believe that this may be their strength as compared to other uh, loss-making IPO. And its recent move uh, to massively uh, cut costs and to adjust to this uh, pandemic actually demonstrate its uh, ability with its uh, asset-like uh, business model. And of course, uh, based on its valuation at the top range of the IPO, it's actually at 7.3 times uh, price to sale. Uh, which is quite uh, pricey if compared to the industry average of around uh, 5.8 times. Uh, but I believe that market may attribute a premium to it uh, for being the home sharing uh, industry leader. And we peg it to online uh, travel giant uh, booking holdings. Uh, the expected price is around uh, 68 uh, US dollar. So now I'll pass on the time to uh, Paul. Paul, please. Yeah, thanks, Chunong. Uh, move on to our usual weekly 
uh, the, the, quite a, a number of, of uh, items, many in Singapore, uh, I'll just briefly run through it. the rest of the thing just for, for reference. Uh, if you look at hospitals, uh, uh, this we collect whatever uh, useful data we can we can get from the from Singapore that's for the Singapore economy. So the the I guess the hospital in terms of hospital admissions is is still weak, but down like nine percent. Uh, the good thing is that dental and specialist numbers are also picking up. Uh, it's quite strong. It's turning to positive, so they are almost hitting back to their pre-COVID levels. Uh, for retail sales, is is still really bad. I think, uh, although it's supposed to be better than last month, but eleven uh, percent is a is a quite a poor number considering Singapore retail sales usually you know maybe plus one minus one. So eleven minus eleven is like you know, ten times worse than before like, year on year. Uh, surprising thing is that supermarket is still very robust. Uh, supermarket sales actually accelerated in October. So this will give you some clue in how Sing Song will perform in the fourth quarter, which is which should be good. I mean 22%. Uh, Pre-COVID supermarket sales probably like one percent to two percent a year. So th- again, it's the flip side, they're growing 10 times faster than with pre-COVID. Uh, some PMI numbers, uh, the message is probably manufacturing activity is still robust. It's even better than 2019, uh, even better than the pre-COVID numbers. Um, visitor arrivals into Singapore is, is still quite pathetic. It's, it's still very poor and sadly, you know, we need had like 13,000 arrivals. Uh, better than last month, but I don't think you want to compare with last month, 9,000. Uh, we usually get about 1.5 million. Uh, later on, I'll just run through some meetings, uh, Philip on the ground. Uh, again, you no, know, we don't cover these talks, but we thought it would be useful just for all the audience to whatever we, we just, uh, we just kind of, so that we know that you may not participate in these meetings. But we just let you get a sense of what transpired in the meetings and some of the key events. Uh, next, we we'll just run through our model portfolio performance. Uh, in terms of our technical views, uh, we, we, there might be another bullish leg. I think uh, what might be coming up will be the FDA meeting of the vaccine 10 December. Uh, as you recall, in November, we had three vaccines that, that uh, not announced positive numbers and the market rallied 20%. So if the FDA meeting on the 10th of December, if FDA announced that they're going to go ahead with the vaccine, then I think that there could be one more leg. I know all this is market sentiment. We're not 100% sure, obviously. But there could be one more leg to play you know, this reopening trade uh, when the vaccine gets approved in the US. Uh, in terms of the events, I think you, you can all see, uh, like Chung Dong mentioned, the Airbnb IPO will happen on the 10th of December. Uh, in terms of poems webinar, we have two more for two more two more last webinars for this week, uh, Elite and Oceanus. Uh, there's also an Eagle Hospitality Trust. Uh, as you know, this thing, this stock has been suspended, but it's only for TRs. And if you have any if any clients or you yourself have any questions, uh, we have to submit it by tomorrow. And you have to maybe uh, contact your TR or if you are TR trading rep yourselves, you can just submit it to the research department. Uh, be, no, because this is a bit, uh, they need to run through the legal before they make any answers. But the, don't worry, uh, whatever happened transpired, although I'm not the read analyst, but whatever transpired in the meeting, uh, we will definitely do, you know, our usual fleet on the ground, just brief whatever we can on what happened in the meeting. And next Monday will be our last web- webinar because most of us will be going on leave and, and it's not the last few weeks of the last two weeks of the year. Uh, in, uh, just very quickly, uh, in terms of the COVID numbers, uh, the good thing is we're starting to, to kind of slow down. It's still growing one on month, but it tends to slowing down. Uh, the US cases is still raging. And I think as you saw in the newspaper today, uh, California, half of California is, is under lockdown. So this is all going to impact the economy you know, because US numbers are still rising to new record levels. Next slide. Uh, Europe, I'm not sure, uh, again, they bend the curve. You can see there's a steep drop and that's positive, especially you know, some of the Singapore businesses have uh, operations in the UK. Uh, 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 Japan, Korea, I think, um, have also hit new record numbers. Um, so far, Malaysia seems to be holding back a bit. Yeah, That's just uh, for everyone's update. Next slide. Uh, Singapore, again, the virus is still present. I think we had like four community cases. We were running on almost 14 days, no community case, I believe, but now we got to four more in one week. And most of the cases, we are like huge 50 imported cases. And I think, if you, again, if you read the newspaper, for us to hit phase three, uh, we need like 70% uh, the, the, on the on the trace token. But right now, I think we're hitting only 50%. So probably unlikely to hit phase three uh, uh, by this year. Uh, I think yeah, no no light here. I think it's quite sad numbers. But I mean, just for your reference, that's, that's, I mean, it's hardly anything, 99.99% drop. Yeah, next slide. 
Uh, the good thing is hospital numbers are picking up, but it's much stronger for dental and specialist care. Uh, you can see that the numbers is almost flat, so almost back to to, you know, year, uh, to kind of uh, pre-COVID levels. But hospital numbers, I guess, without the foreign without foreign patients, uh, I don't think they can ever. I don't think they can hit back to pre-COVID numbers uh, uh, in terms of uh, pre-COVID admission numbers. For, for retail, again, this is just for your reference, but just to show you how how healthy the supermarket sales. If you look at supermarket sales plus 22%, then if you look at the numbers in the middle, the five-year the five year KEGA, that means the five-year growth rate pre-COVID for supermarket was only 1.3. So it's still very, very robust numbers we see out of supermarket. For the overall general retail sales, again, if you look at the, 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 the five-year KEGA, no, basically flat for Singapore, but October down 11, so it's still very weak uh, retail sales up for Singapore. So it's quite a big negative number, at least year on year. Uh, PMI is just to show you that, uh, that no, uh, the PMI numbers, that means manufacturing activity in Singapore, better than 2019. I mean, if you want to sum it up, uh, we got 50.4. The average in 2019 was 50. For electronics, even better, it's about 51. The 2019 average of 49.5. So like manufacturing activity is one that's helping the economy to offset the weakness in services. Okay, uh, Philip, I'll, uh, I'll run through quickly for these two, but I guess first, read that, one, that might have to spend a bit more time. Uh, Fai's Orchard give a presentation. Uh, uh, they don't really give much details. Uh, sometimes I wonder why they want to do such things. But anyway, uh, they lost money, 6 million. So what this company does is they, they actually own hotels, like 60, 70% of the profits come from hotels. And you can think of them like they're trying to build a huge, so they, they have like, 16,000 rooms and 100 properties. Uh, not everything is owned. Some of it is through joint venture. Some is they just do like hotel management. So they're trying to be, uh, you know, uh, like a better word, uh, Hilton, Unimi, I guess, like try to run, uh, become a hotel, global hotel, or at least because they got hotels in Australia and Singapore. Uh, they also have PBSA, which is student dorms. So right now they've got like, I think 3,500 beds. Uh, if you want to have a comparison, uh, uh, their you know, SPH is double their size. Uh, SPH is about 7,000 bits. Uh, and uh, not, uh, again, not much details from them, uh, but anyway, hotel industry, hotels are not doing well, so don't expect much growth, much uh, much improvement in the results in the next few few months. Uh, we also have BRC numbers. Uh, actually, considering the environment, they actually did reasonably well. I think it was only down 36, considering the construction was frozen for the last six months. So what, what is happening, just as a refresh, uh, BRC is the, is, I think they got 70-80% market share of the rebar, steel and wire mesh in the construction industry. Uh, then what, what is happening on the ground right now uh, in construction, uh, there's a shortage of foreign workers. So I think if you are someone who employs foreign workers, everyone is trying to snatch your worker. Uh, then the second thing is that uh, in construction, uh, the workers cannot perform the job. Uh, simultaneously. I think what he gave as an example, you know, you, you can't do the painting guy, can't do that, and the, the painter and the taller cannot work at the same time. Everyone has to take turns. So obviously this is going to slow down uh, 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 construction activity, not for the whole of Singapore. Uh, for them, they also got affected by the productivity, you know, because when you want to do a handover of shifts, you know, you got to clean the place up. So they also affected. So everything is slowed down. Uh, okay. Uh, they, uh, yeah, I think uh, next slide. Okay, and anyway, we, we also, again, I'm not the real analyst, but we had the first read, they announced the, their restructuring of the master list. So just as a refresh, uh, you know, they have 14 hospitals. Most of it is in, in Indonesia. And the current lease agreements that they have with their parent, the sponsor, uh, Lipo Karawachi, is, is, it, was, it, it could not be maintained. Okay, So what, what is happening, I just give you the gist. Uh, uh, the base rent, 19, 91 million now. In future, it will drop down to 56. Uh, okay, but anyway, the net net impact, just to cut the story short, is that the MPI will decline, uh, the leverage will jump to 48%, and the DPU, I guess that's what everyone's concerned of, most interested in, will actually slash by almost half from 2019, from 8.6 cents to 4.4 cents. So the stock now is about 40 cents, so the yield now is probably around 10%. But the only thing, uh, so the positive is that you no, know, they clear the overhang. I think there was issues in refinancing, you no, know, because without this thing, yeah, the banks are not clear what kind of rental income you're going to get, you no, know, and then the, the valuers are not sure what to do. But this, I guess, clears the overhang. Uh, the other positive is the, the the important one is the the base rent escalation, the number two. 
it used to be, you know, tech to CPI, you know, Singapore don't have any inflation, so probably zero, maximum two. But right now it's fixed to 4.5. So that's the probably the, the, the best part of this whole restructuring. Uh, there's a fixed excellence. So every year you're going to get a 4.5% growth. Uh, the wheel lengthen is one thing. But the negative is that, uh, of course, the, the base rent will drop 90 to 56. And right now, uh, you know, in the past, uh, Lipo, which is the sponsor, the listed property developer, will pay... I know it's a bit complicated. They will pay first read uh, uh, in Sing dollars, but right now they will pay first read in Indonesia rupiah. But of course, the positive is that you know historically Indonesia rupiah to Sing dollar depreciate roughly. I mean, roughly uh, about two percent a year. So this four point five can actually almost offset the in the longer term span. I mean, year on year could vary, but could actually offset any weakness you see in in rupiah against Sing dollar. I, I'm just using historical numbers. Okay, but the only thing, although the yield is strong, the, the one thing to watch for is, uh, is, is two, three things, uh, uh, or maybe two things, is that in, they have uh, 400 million of loans, uh, but the banks only want to refinance them 260 million. So they got this, uh, I wouldn't, not a whole, uh, this 140 million that they need to either look for new financing or maybe raise, they need to raise money for somehow for, to fill the 140 million. So very high chance, although they never mentioned, but very high chance they need to do an equity raising. Considering even with that debt, their yield, their gearing, like we mentioned, is close to the 50, 50%, which is uh, their gearing is now 48%, 47.9%. So they're very close to hitting the 15 mark, and I don't think any read want to take that, that risk. So very high chance they will do some, some equity raising, in my opinion. I mean, of course, they did not mention uh, the other thing, I guess the last thing issue uh, is that, uh, you, you know how this works? Uh, there's the CELOM, the hospital operator CELOM. Then CELOM will, will pay rent to LIPO, then LIPO would pay to First Street. I know it's a bit complicated, but, but the problem is that CELOM is, I mean, roughly only paying half of the rent and LIPO still needs to subsidize that another 50%. So this thing is not unravel. So basically LIPO still needs to subsidize the hospital. So. Of course, if it's if it's one for one, it'll be even better. But so you still need Lipo to come out, and you still in, in the end depend on Lipo Karawachi's financial uh, financials, uh, the stability of the financials. Uh, I guess that's one way to read it. Again, we don't have a view, but uh, this is just since we were in a meeting, we just raised all this for you. Uh, this is just for reference. We took it out. These are probably the most important parts of the master list uh, restructuring. Uh, we, we just leave it. Uh, you can get it from, from SGX too, but we just posted it for, for your reference. Anybody wants to go through. Okay, yeah, this is my last slide. This is the performance of our absolute 10. So uh, uh, the left table is our, our, our top 10, uh, our model portfolio of 10 stocks. So you can see that the big performers were were, were all the cyclical stocks, property, transport, uh, uh, and also consumer. Because I think with the with the vaccine news, all this performed. The one that dragged us down, or at least didn't move that much, uh, were all the yield names, uh, obviously. The yield underperformed, uh, net link, I mean, all this won't move because there's vaccine. Uh, and the table on the right is just the, the sectors that did well. So what put was the, the banks did really well in November. I think the banks, I think DBS was up more than 20%. I think OCBC by 18. Right? So the banks put up, put up the whole STI index. The other one was transport, of course, got SIA sets and so forth. Uh, consumer is the Genting and so forth, all this that did well. So we, 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 we were up about 11, but again, we underperformed the STI because we, we didn't have any banks, so they outperformed. But, but for the year, we're okay. But again, this performance is just for illustration. Okay, I think that's it, and we can go for for Q and A. Yeah, th thanks everyone for uh, attending this, uh, and also uh, for all your questions. We will try to address uh, as many questions as we, as we can. Uh, thank you. Uh, hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so I saw some questions uh, from uh, from Tanker Park. So uh, answer few of them, and then I'll pass on my time to my colleague. So just uh, bear with me for uh, um, ten to fifteen minutes. Okay, so uh, just allow me to share my screen first. Okay, so um, this is my screen. So uh, first, I was first up. I will start with um, the SDI index um, by Chris, and then go by EM, and then SFI. Okay, so for SDI, I think um, nothing much change. Okay, so except that um, price has to revert back a uh, lower correction down to where below the um, two eight seven three seven um, resistance. So currently, we are right now at a, a, a possible rebound, but 
Uh, because of this bearish candle, I think it's due to the um, futures, um, the Dow futures is coming, seeing some sell down in the Asia, in the, uh, Asia session. So I think there's a, there's a few times that you will go down. Um, I mean, um, to, the, to the support in the even zone at 2761 to 2784. Uh, then after that, price will actually uh, take higher to test uh, about 3000. So, yeah. Um, and another thing is, uh, if you look closely, we are actually on the, like, like what I mentioned, a few, I think, a, a quite a number of webinars that STI actually is on the double zigzag uh, of the week, week theory. So, uh, potentially. Okay, so, uh, wave Y, currently we are still not, uh, we, I, I think that's a possible that wave Y is still not yet complete because, uh, why? Because if we do a FP, Fibonacci extension, uh, we can see that the 1.3236 and 1.618 has yet to be met. So minimum target we are looking at 2936 and possibly about 3000. All right, that's for the SDI. All right, but December may be a volatile month. I think this year due to the COVID situation, um, the sell down and etc. I think um, the market around the world may be uh, a bit volatile. Uh, whether it's up or down, we, we still need more data. To Okay, so I move on to um, AM. AM, I did a buy call on, I think, on November, I think two weeks ago. So uh, price did steady um, advancing to, to potentially break out of the um, um, uh, falling wedge. Uh, however, there's a false breakout and then followed by a bearish and nothing. And then uh, currently there's a potential bearish candle here. Uh, this like a uh, evening star. So uh, first of all, we might be looking at the first support uh, um, uh, three two three to three three one, and then followed by. I think I'm ultimately I'm still I'm still I'm still uh, very positive that our price have a strong will have a strong buy at two point six to two point nine seven despite all these uh, correction going on. So collective uh, stance is not is is not over yet. So yeah, we are still looking for it. Okay, so that's for AEM and then followed by yes. Okay, so I'll answer that. So um okay so there's a question on IFAS now 31%. Before that I'll pass my time to Yvonne. So but let's look at IFAS the uh, technical. So uh IFAS I did mention that in my report in, in November. I think IFAS if IFAS still to clear above three three dollar ninety cents to four dollars I think price, uh, there will be a extended corrective flag, uh, but the corrective flag is kind of like very strong. And then as such, we think that uh, the C wave has really become the impulse wave. So there might be further correction down to uh, 2.26 or uh, slightly uh, rebound at 2.49 to 2.5. Okay, so IFA generally uh, not, not really, uh, we do they get down actually push prices all the way to bearish and then Look at Ichimoku. Um, if this is going to cross below, and then um, and then if this is going to cross below, then we are looking at a, at, at a potential three bearish cross death cross really for IFAS, and that means that uh, further bearish downside uh, and operation will be will be seen. Okay, so um, I move on to F for this one. Um, I move for Wilma. Then before I go on to the bank, uh, Wilma has been doing well. Um, we found it. Um, three white so. A uh, 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 three white soldier. So, um, prices may is still trending below the top. Okay, so um, so we are not really that positive on it. But on the on the positive note, uh, we are on a potential on which a uh, very positive one. So price may if price is going to break four point four four as a resistance line, then we will see a price will mainly target four point six zero to four point five three. Okay. And then uh, this one is the banks. Let me see the banks. The banks on um, like BDS, um, BDS, like the SDI, uh, double zigzag. Uh, but if you look closely, we have a uh, one, two, three, four, five sub wave to form wave C. So um, the pattern over here may, may symbolize a corrective action over here today. So if price ma manage to stay above 2, 3, 4, 4, 8, 5, then uh, we can safely that say that uh, in the short term, there will be uh, still upside to $27 and etc. So uh, because there's a gap over here, so we 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 tend to believe that the gap is going to be tested um, uh, in, in the long term in the future. So yeah, we shall look at it uh, for the banks and then see for OCBC uh, pendant as well. Um, I think my target zone is 10.51 for now. Okay. 
So that's for the banks. And then, um, then uh, next one will be the last one will be uh, Yang Zhijiang. And uh, I'll go Yang Zhijiang first. Yang Zhijiang last week has a very uh, bullish divergence. And then after that, um, price actually make up a lot higher, but I don't think that is a very strong uh, upside. So long term wise, I think that um, I'm looking at 0 0.845 for you know, long. That's for Yang Zhijiang. But other, other than that, I have no question for. I have no like, further input for Yang Zhijiang and stuff. And then last one be some power, some um, some some power sorry. So some power uh high price of seven zero point seven five have been met. Uh price may face some further correction down to zero seven six nine zero before we uh going to edge up higher. If you look at the weekly chart, uh weekly chart we have already broken the multi point resistance point. So uh, technically we are seeing a, a temporary upside really. So uh, 0 0.815 is possible. So yeah, we shall look for it. Okay. And then another thing is you look at that, this uh, elongated um uh, uh, bullish flag. And then uh upside. So minimally other than 0 0.815, long term wise, I think we can see 0 0.875 and 0 0.8 uh 0 0.940 is a very super long one. Okay, then lastly, land list, land list uh straight up. Okay, so land list is attempting to break over the 0 0.715 uh, um uh resistance line so we are looking at a uh, possible if this is is successfully staying above so we are looking at 0 0.775 to be tested as well and then ultimately the, the ultimate target is uh, 0 0.845 to 8, 0 0.860 uh if you look at ichimoku ichimoku has really displayed the, the three golden cross and uh, we are on the upside and then this like a v-shape recovery on the upside okay so with that, I end on my presentation for the technical part. So I'll pass my time to Rigon for the IFAS part. Thank you. Thank you, Viren. Okay, so uh, okay, generally, so today IFAS was down, I think generally because they did not, uh, as in cost of the digital banking license, right? I think, um, uh, yeah, so they did not, they were not successful in getting the digital wholesale bank license. I think this is a digital full bank. Yeah, I'm not sure which digital banking license, but the digital banking bit was, uh, was not successful so uh, I'm not very sure of the actual valuations but what I do know is that uh, their valuations were already on the very high end and they were running the the, the narrative that uh, they were quite positive on the on the on the digital banking license bid as such I think the current sell down is probably due to some some disappointment in expectations that were not met uh, with this uh, failure of the digital banking bid but uh, in the long term I felt that uh, generally, previously, the valuations were going a bit high for them. Yeah, so I think this is just a correction. I'm not sure whether it is more, of course, it will be now be more uh, properly valued with this fall down, uh, this sharp fall, but I'm not, I, I do not think that, uh, I think in the long run, uh, they are still a grow, growing company, but they will have to find uh, other focus of growth and also not to, not to, uh, not to remove the fact that I mean, for the digital banking license side, uh, we do know that uh, MES is already still open to, they are still open to uh, uh, accepting other digital wholesale bank license. So that might be something uh, in the future, lah, but not, 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 not so, so much in the short term. Uh, yeah, uh, 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 let me try to uh, just help me think on this one. Uh, if, you, if you look at IFAS, uh, if you analyze the, the their numbers. Uh, they're you are looking at fifty times PE, and and this is for this year. And earnings were well, and this is assuming earnings double this year. So historically, the we are looking at probably hundred times PE. Uh, this year the earnings is up in because you know capital markets are so so buoyant. Number one and number two, uh, there's been some change in the CPF ruling. So there've been a lot of uh, uh because they rely on on a lot of FAs. On their platform, so a lot of FAs have been you know, trying to aggressively sell more products because uh, there there's some change in the in the, the commission ruling it for some CPA products. I'm not sure the details. Uh, so, so the only thing uh, that could be uh, that the market could be speculating again. I'm I know I'm not firm with the details, but they are bidding for this thing called the EMPF -E uh, system in in Hong Kong uh, because in in Hong it's like a CPF. It will be the system that will manage the, the Hong Kong's equivalent of CPF. Uh, so, uh, and they are partnering with the rumor is that they are, I mean, their slides are they're partnering with PC, PCCW. So, I guess 
no, they never mentioned, they don't give details at all. Um, so I guess if they actually win, that will be a big win for the, uh, on paper, I think then maybe if anyone who wants to buy unit trust will have to use their platform in Hong Kong uh, on this EMPF. Uh, it's called the, uh, you know, the mandatory provision, in terms of central, they call it mandatory provident fund. So that could be one speculation. But again, if you if you don't have all this or stand alone, or this stock is expensive about 50 times on no really kind of turbo charge kind of earnings. Okay, um let, let me just let's move on to, to some uh, other questions that were that were uh, that, that were for me. Uh okay, uh, let me just run to supermarket sales still strong, but Sing Song share price keeps going lower. What is your view? Uh you know, we, we still like Sing Song. I mean, Sing Song has been not taking like has historically grown like 10 times faster than the market. Uh, it, it's just that uh, with this vaccine, um, uh, we, it looks expensive at, 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 the, at the current mo moment. The reason why I'm struggling to give you a good answer is because it's, it's no one um, no one really knows the what is the growth rate post-vaccine. Post um, so that's why my my target price. Uh, sorry, let me just run. Through, let me sorry, just give me one one quick uh, quick second. Uh, I'm just uh, we have a, a we have a, assuming uh, our target price is, is based on. Sorry, I give give you one quick second. I, I forgot to, to, to double check. Uh, our target price is one seventy one, and we are just forecasting based on uh, FY next year's earnings. So, so, so I, I don't think we will change on our target price on, on that, but it is encouraging uh, that, that I thought by now the sales should be, should, so these levels look look uh, look interesting. I mean, it's 155 now, uh, and the, the market is just assuming that, that you no know, uh, supermarket sales will just collapse, but it seems to be holding up much better than, than everyone thought. And even post-COVID, I think it could still sustain. I mean, there's more work from home, even next year, so uh, we still stick to our target price of one seventy something. So I think one fifty five it looks uh, looks interesting at this level. So. Yeah. So, so sorry to hesitate because this is not an easy, easy one to answer. Uh, what's your view on Singtel now? Yeah, I, I think I saw the the Singtel price run up on this bank. Uh, this digital license. I I, I I think it's a bit of overreaction. Okay. Uh, let me just run through the numbers. Um. Okay. Uh, firstly. How much is going to be invested in this digit, full digital license is roughly about 100 million. They might inject more, but let's say you use 100 million. So even if you are aggressive, uh, you think Singter and Grab are the best bankers in town. Uh, they, so you assume, let's say, 30% 30, 30 ROE. Oh, you, you also yeah. don't have any. So yeah, even yeah, yeah. If, you, uh, if you assume 30% oh, ROE, heard, uh, heard, uh, uh, Bicom, can you move? move? Uh, even if you assume thirty percent ROE, you're looking at a 30, 30 million profit from this entity. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming they're the best bankers in town, but because most likely they will lose money for the first few years. So thirty percent, thirty million, and uh, Singtel has a forty percent stake in this venture. So at most, this thing can make let's say roughly maybe twelve million. Uh, but the market cap today just went up two billion. So of, uh, we just think that it's a bit of overreaction. Uh, if you just use those numbers. Uh, then number two, uh, the, the challenges of, of a di digital bank. Uh, it, uh, uh, I think we highlighted this before, but just a reminder for everyone. Uh, in, so far globally, in terms of the digital bank, the way you make money is you either lend money or you transfer money. Trans transfer money is, I think the only way, the, ever, the one avenue for them is probably transfer money. That would be the one way to, to kind of make, make money or to complement the, the business. Uh. To lend money, uh, it's going to be a challenging of the, all the existing banks. And the second challenge for any digital bank is what is the, the most cost effective way to raise deposits? Because if you want to lend money, you have to be very cost effective. You basically have to compete with DBS or you want to go and uh, you want to have a cheaper cost of funds. So there's a lot of challenges for them. For me, I just think it's more to complement, I guess more to complement uh, Grab rather than to complement Singtel. Uh, unless Singtel want to do can transfer money better than a, a DBS can uh, or lend money better than a DBS because you want to lend money you better find a cheap way to raise a lot of, of deposits because that 100 million not going to move the needle so that's why we are a bit uh, a bit more skeptical on on this digital bank uh, moving the needle for Singtel in terms of valuations so, yeah 100 million I don't think uh, they are 40 percent 40 million not going to move it for them uh, that's my own view 
Uh, we no change in our target price. Our target price is around this level, about 240, 40 something. Okay, uh, let me just uh, move on to credit bureau. Uh, the next question is, um, credit bureau, although does not have a fixed dividend policy, uh, it intends to recommend dividend of at least 90% of the group uh, group profit after tax for FY21-22. Is uh, credit bureau a good dividend play? The valuations for for credit bureau rough um, is probably about 30 times piece. So if you're going to flip it, so maybe the yield now about 2%. Uh, is it a good dividend play? Uh, on 2%, no, but on, on them being a monopoly, yes, because you know, their pre-tax margins, the PVT margins is 50%. And like we highlighted before, this is a, this is virtually a monopoly uh, in Singapore, in, in Philippines, and also in Myanmar. And as a reminder, uh, why this is important, because for a bank to lend money, uh, before I lend money to you, I need to check if you have any loans to any other bankers, whether credit card, banking loan, housing loan, so you can see how this is a necess necessary service for all banks. Uh, the non-banks also use it to check on the, the credit standing of, of anyone that wants to you know, take credit from them. So this is an essential service and, and that's why uh, it will be expensive. I don't think this stock will ever trade, uh, I'm not sure ever, but I don't think this stock can trade at a, at a cheap level, uh, maybe 10 times. Uh, it will be very challenge, very difficult to get that level unless something really drastic changes. Because everybody knows this is a, this is a, uh, this is a very good business to own. Uh, I'm not sure if I actually answered that question, but but that is my my view right now. Uh, the next question: uh, We Grab and Singtel granted digital bank license. Would Singtel increase in price, or the lack of roaming revenue still pull down Singtel? Or are there any factors that would affect Singtel price? Uh, I uh, I think I think we partly answered that. Um, moving forward, I think the roaming revenue issue would would be behind them. I think because all the year a new comparison would be over. This thing started only in the second quarter. So by, by you know, next quarter, you know, more or less, everyone already knows about roaming revenue impact. Uh, Australia will still be there for the next few months. So it will be a slow climb for Singtel. Uh, uh, um, I think once the um, international roaming comes back, then you can see the, the growth coming back to Singtel. Otherwise, it will be a, a, a slow and steady struggle, I guess. And maybe they, they might be selling some towers in Indonesia, so that could maybe help in terms of maybe a, a short term, a small one off dividends. Yeah. Yeah. So for me, we are, we are still neutral on Singtel. Any rise will be very gradual, I mean, in, in my own opinion. Okay. Uh, the next question, why credit bureau since IPO keep coming down, I buy 117, is it worth keep or cut loss or at how much? We, we still like the business, but you no, know, you're coming in at, uh, um, because the IPO is 93, right? And, and the public tranche is only 1 million, yeah, which is quite disgusting anyway. Uh, so the obviously it's be some profit takers, but in terms of the business alone, um, Myanmar only started, I think a month ago. So you might have to, this this thought you have to be a bit patient because you need because they just started in new markets. Huh? So I mean if, if if they can if Myanmar and Philippines can be another Singapore, I mean they, I mean the business can grow maybe fifty at least fifty or maybe double. Uh, yeah, I, I never cover, but I'm just saying uh, theoretically because they are into two new markets where the population is, is even larger, right? Yeah. So there is, uh, there's room to grow, but it, it, it takes time. Uh, I know this stock is not going to be like a, a one month, two month kind of jump in, in price. Because, yeah, because the IPO already did that, I guess. Uh, uh, next question is for, for you, uh, Jehu is your mom. Okay, um, the next question we have is on um, the M financial IPO and whether or not it will affect Yoma. So um, I think that this question is more specific towards uh, wave money. And um, in my view, I don't think that um, the delay of N's IPO will have any significant impact on um, wave because um, wave businesses are independent on its own. And um, yeah, um, so like the proposed acquisition of a 33% stake in wave money um, was actually announced in May. And then, um, although the proposed tick acquisition is still ongoing, um, and is actually already acting as like a shareholder of Wave, yeah. So, um, I don't, I don't foresee like any issues arising from the delay of N's IPO. I would think that, um, N's collaboration with Wave, uh, will still continue. Yeah, and um, this is actually um, yeah, mentioned during the call as in like during um the analyst call, um Duma was saying that yeah as in like they were they were still they are still working together, yeah right now even though like the state acquisition is still ongoing. I think the next question is for Jin Rong. 
Yeah, thanks, Jeffrey. So uh, the next question is on Airbnb. So the question says uh, Airbnb is 7.3 PE. Uh, this should be price to sales ratio, not uh, price to earnings. Uh, but anyway, the question is, uh, you mentioned this on the higher range of uh, hospitality. What is the general ratio we should look at and what is the reasonable ratio we should expect from uh, Airbnb? Okay, um, so thanks Elvin for the question. So firstly, uh, the 7.3 7 ratio is price to sales. Uh, personally, I think there may be little significance to look at uh, PE because ultimately Airbnb, their focus is not on uh, turning over a profit. Like for example, uh, pre-COVID, you can see that whatever a uh, profit they churn, they tend to splurge back in terms of uh, marketing expenses. So their focus could be more on, uh, on uh, expanding, which will be reflected in their, in their revenue itself. And uh, yes, compared to the uh, online travel booking space, uh, which has an average uh, price to sales ratio of around 5.8, uh, having a price to sales ratio of 7.3 is definitely on the higher range. And, uh, it's hard to attribute a reasonable ratio. Why? Because Airbnb is a home sharing service. So in a way, is their business model is actually, um, there's some differences uh, compared to other online uh, booking sites like uh, Booking Holdings, uh, Expedia, all this. So it's hard to attribute a, a reasonable ratio to it because there's not a lot of uh, home sharing uh, listed companies for us to, to run a comparison. But like I mentioned, uh, if you were to peg it to uh, Booking Holdings, which is uh, a market leader in terms of the, the uh, travel online uh, booking space, uh, is expected price based on the price to sales is around 68. And um, just in, I think one hour ago, uh, the new there's a new information that I, uh, they are actually uh, raising their targeted, uh, their targeted IPO price to uh, between if I'm not wrong, it's uh, yeah, between 56 and $60. So um, this is definitely a pricier uh, uh, take on it. Lah. So if back, if uh, like I mentioned, if back to booking holdings, the, the expected price is around 68 lah. So um, yeah, this is my take on it. It's really hard to attribute a, a reasonable ratio for comparison. Yeah. Um, I will go on to answer other question. Uh, there is one that says, are we able to subscribe to Airbnb IPO through Philip Capital. Um, so sorry, we you are not able to subscribe to any uh, US IPO uh, through Philip. So uh, the only way if you want to share is to uh, buy them from the market uh, on the 10th of December. Yeah, and for everyone's information, um, uh, US IPO uh, that does not mean market open, you can straight away trade a share. So there is some, uh, there's some procedures to, to match the price. So probably you, the, the Airbnb IPO may only open around, uh, based on personal experience, usually IPO open around 12 plus AM. So do not be surprised if you log in at 10.30 uh, PM and then you find that uh, Airbnb is not trading. Yeah, you have to uh, give it some time. Yeah. And I think there is one, uh, sorry, there's one more questions. Uh, give me a moment. Yeah, uh, it says that latest news say that Airbnb price per share will increase to 56 to 60. Is it still a good buy? Um, yeah, like I mentioned, uh, just in one hour ago, they actually raised the, the estimated IPO uh, range to 56 to 60. Um, like I mentioned, the valuation is on a, a pricier end. Uh, based on the, I'm, I'm actually taking the pre-COVID uh, revenue and then uh, looking at its price to sales ratio, it's already 7.3 uh, times. So if they were to raise this uh, higher, you know, uh, it, no surprise, it may go on to uh, or even 10 times. So it's really very hard to say because with this market now, if uh, market deem you as a, a, a strong growth company, uh, they will definitely give you a, a premium. An uh, example would be in terms of Tesla with uh, 20 times price to sales. So it, it, it's hard to justify if you look it if you look at it from a valuation uh, standpoint. So uh, if you were to ask me uh, personally, I, I'm not too sure you know, what is the proper uh, price that it can, it can uh, get on IPO day itself. Yeah, so uh, this is my take on it, but I believe that market will attribute, uh, definitely attribute a premium to it because it is the market leader in terms of uh, home sharing uh, uh, services. So uh, that's all from me, thank you. 
Yeah, and and Airbnb is is what the 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 two things rare about Airbnb is that uh, they are a platform. So, so so the value of the platform is as more users use it, the the barriers rise. As as you no know, when more people come in, then more more room inventory will come in, and then when more room inventory come in, then more users will come in. So when you have a platform business, the the barriers keep on rising day by day, and and the second thing is that they got like unlimited inventory uh. you can think of it like because like, the inventory is the whole world uh. so they they not like they're not constrained by any inventory issue so they got the unlimited inventory and, so, and they really penetrated the international market uh, uh, you would think about that i mean airbnb they actually have no right to earn this type of profit they don't they don't even come out with a single dollar to build a house or build a hotel but they start but they kind of can make so, so much revenue so so it's a bit insane in, a, in, that, in that way right because you you the hotel, those who run a hotel, they have to come up with capital, build a hotel. Even if you are Hilton, you have to come up with capital to manage. But the beauty of the business, they don't even have to do that. Yeah. So it's a really you know, very, very unique business with high barriers. Okay, let's move on to the to the next. Uh, okay, I, I will just run through this, uh, the SIA question. Okay, it's a very long uh, question. Uh, again, it's about the calculation of the MCB. Uh, okay, I, let me do this. I will email the your your question to SIA because I'm not sure how to answer whether is it legal and and which parts of the accounting standard, like you like you highlighted, which is a very good question. You highlighted why the MCBs are considered as equity, but at the same time they are not diluted. Uh, I'm not sure if that's the same thing for the. Yeah, the perpetuals are not diluted, so but the perpetuals are not not ordinary shares. Uh, I, I I don't have the answer for you. I've copied this message and let me send it send the email to SIA and try to get an answer. But but do know that I you know uh, SIA don't want to allow me to, to attend their briefings, so I'm not sure how much luck I will get from from this question. Uh, but but I I will try my best to try and get you an answer. Okay, because it's a very good question and and, 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 and well justified to ask them. Uh, um, we call, uh, sorry, uh, Vera, I think we probably have only more, another five minutes. There's probably some TA that you want to go through. Uh, yeah, sure. For, um, we want to go through the, the progress of the question because I think I'll take on the, the last one before the closing. So I think we got like, another five to ten minutes more to take on the last few questions. Um, I, I don't know what you want. Uh, I don't know uh, how is it, how you want to go about it, Paul. Okay, sure, sure, no, no problem. Okay, uh, let me just let's run through all, all these things. Uh, is SIA going to benefit a lot from this vaccine? I wouldn't say a lot. Uh, yeah, you might help at the at the margin. Yeah, but but you, you but uh, I think you saw the numbers, right? I think their person number of airline passengers are down like 70, 80 percent. I think we showed it last one or two weeks, maybe 80 percent down. It will help at the margin. I don't think it will help. And you know, this is not like transporting. Uh, no transport. These are not huge cargo. Maybe one plane shipment you can cover probably half the population. I'm just exaggerating. You know, these are small little doses. Maybe two, two or three flights can cover. Uh, again, I don't know. You know, you're, you're not carrying something huge. These are small little vials of of vaccine. Uh, these are not like uh, bulky, bulk, bulky wine bottles, which which you know which we all like. But it's, these are not like bulky wine bottles. These are really small little vials of vaccine. So I don't think it will move the. I don't think it will be meaningful for them in terms of the, the revenue. Uh, I, again, they don't give us numbers, but this is just for my own my own view, I guess. Uh, okay, I think uh, on the out, uh, um, I'm not sure City on answer. How last week's webinar we couldn't upload? Yeah, I think we had some technical issues, right, City? I'm not sure City is right. Uh, City is not here, but uh, I know uh, what happened is uh, I think we had some uh, problem with the recording with Zoom, so we are uh, we are in the midst of uh, discussing with Zoom to to actually retrieve the file from last week. So bear with us for that, for, for this time now. Okay, so sorry about that. Yeah. Yeah, I think City usually uploads it within a couple of hours, but I think there was we had some technical difficulty. Yeah. Th thanks for bringing up and, and sorry for the inconvenience. Uh, any target price for credit bureau? Uh, we, we, we don't cover, so we don't really have a, a target price to, to help you with. Uh, well, Bikon, you want to do, uh, I'm not sure if you want to answer this question on the, the, the second question. Yeah, okay. Uh, okay. So the question is from the experience in other countries, Hong Kong, South Korea, etc. How significant is the digital banking uh, license going to uh, affect local banks? Okay, uh, so I do not have much uh, details on the digital banking, digital banks overseas. Um, but what I do have is a little bit of 
detail, uh, some context uh, of what like digital banks in Hong Kong is trying to do. So from what I understand, uh, like digital banks in Hong Kong actually, their business is starting because they just uh, announced their license I think just last year. Uh, and it's, they are, the, the business that they're doing is very restricted. So all of them, uh, I think there were eight successful applicants and unlike Singapore, so Singapore, all three banks can already start doing all their digital banking stuff like we have seen. Uh, for Hong Kong, uh, even the incumbent bank, the traditional banks need to apply for a digital banking license. And then uh, all eight successful applicants are currently only doing deposits for now. They're not even starting to lend out no credit cards, no anything. So from what I heard is that uh, people are only signing up to these uh, digital banking accounts, but they're not really using it. So uh, it seems like, uh, I mean, yeah, the barrier of entry into a, especially like Singapore, Hong Kong, this kind of uh, well bank society is probably quite high. And to, yeah, so, so I, I don't think that, uh, I think there's a very long way before we start seeing any, any things that the digital banks can do to actually disrupt the industry. I know people always talk about, oh, they can provide lower interest rates on your loans, higher interest rate on your deposits, but uh, whether that will, I mean, for higher interest rate for Hong Kong, if I'm not wrong, yes, they do, but how sustainable it is. And if there is such a, a, a room for arbitrage in terms of interest rate or to higher, offer higher interest rate on deposits, I am sure the traditional banks will also uh, try to eat into the pie as well. So it is not as easy as what we think, uh, yeah, just by the cost of funding, etc. And uh, I think that's for the, okay, I'm sorry. Okay, that's one. I think I have another question on what is the likely impact of the China state-owned entity uh, banks that defaulted. Okay, so I think that question is a bit misleading. So there's an impact of China SOE banks that defaulted on their bond on our local banks. So to understand the China SOEs and China SOE banks is different thing. So if you take a look at the the breakdown of the loan books uh, by, okay, so uh, we have exposure to China state-owned entities as well as Chinese banks. So that's two separate things. Um, if you want to know what happened last week, I think well, there, there, there was a story on Hua Chen, which is, I think, automotive company, which is a, yeah, automotive company that is a state-owned entity and they actually defaulted. So their largest foreign lender, that, yeah, largest foreign creditor is actually DBS and DBS's exposure to them is about uh, 150 to 180 million dollars, sing dollars. Um, so we probably will see this appear in the specific provisions for DBS in the fourth quarter. So there's probably some weakness. And um, based on what I take a look across the three banks, um, UOB, their exposure to these kind of state-owned entities uh, in, even in China, like the China exposure is just much lesser than, than the rest of the other two banks. And in particular to the state-owned entity is even lesser probably. So it's probably negligible when you compare it to things like uh, the, the oil and gas industry crisis that was in 2016-2017. Then for uh, probably about 5%, if you, if you take a ballpark figure, it's about 5% of their loan book is, is uh, chi in China. Then for uh, OCBC and DBS, it is about 10 to 15%. So I think in terms of exposure to Chinese state-owned entities, of course, it will be a part of the 10 to uh, 10 to 15%. You take about, I don't know, 50% to the state-owned entities. That is the risk that you're looking at. But I think in comparison as a whole, the it won't be like an entire, entire uh, write-off of the credit, like what happened to the oil and gas industry, but more of uh, some focus of weakness uh, in, 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 their, in their bonds. Yep. I think I'll now pass the time back to Weiren to finish up uh, on the TA side. All right, thank you, Weiren. So, yeah. Uh, okay. okay, so uh, you can see my screen on Sing Shong. I think basically um, the, the technical part, I think we have pay and show permission. I think last week I shared before. Um, there's a strong long side. Okay, so um, currently we are kind of like supported on the um, next resistance, uh, next support, sorry, at uh, 1.52. So, but I, I think that there's a strong chance that uh, it might be lost. First, uh, because of this um, bullish and on last Friday, um, today price didn't really um, have a gap up, but we formed the inside bar. So, currently we are kind, kind of like ranging on a smaller time frame, on a smaller scale. So, um, we have to look at uh, either way, if price is really going to break 1.57 and 1.60. Then we can see a request up to 1.69 before uh, a sell down occur. 
Yeah, otherwise, it's probably going to break below. Um, the next one will be 1.44 to 1.47 for uh, next next stage of rebound. Uh, if you dive into Ichimoku, we, we can look at uh, Ichimoku is already showing three signs of uh, bearish crossover. So uh, technically, right now, um, Seng Shong is going on the bearish uh, downside for a correction, I would say. All right, so if you, if you elongated it, I think um, definitely we are still on our trend. But uh, on a small uh, small scale, we are definitely uh, like on, on a downtrend because uh, first of all, Ichimoku is going downtrend and uh, lower low, lower high, lower low. Okay, so that I have my presentation. Um, please, um, next week will be our last uh, webinar for the year 2020 on the 14th of uh, December. So um, after that, we'll see you all, all again next year. So remember next week, my calendar, this will be our last session. All right. So without further ado, uh, if you have any questions, drop us an email or visit our website at uh, our community page, type in our question, and then we will try our best answer. All right. Thank you very much. And have a good Monday ahead. Bye-bye.